In this chapter, we are going to introduce the convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, specifically for image understanding. The concept here illustrated can be easily extended to different kinds of input, like audio or video. All it requires is going to be a slightly variation in the type of convolution that is going to be utilized. We will start with the rational and motivation. Why are convolutional neural networks needed in order to process images? We will see that the fundamental aspects of a convolutional neural network is sparsity, which exploits locality in the input data. And specifically, we will introduce the receptive field and the hierarchical view of deep models. And the second main important aspect of convolutional neural network is that they perform parameters sharing, which is based on the assumption of homogeneity of the input data. We will see then how a convolutional layer will perform a 3D convolution in the case of image processing. Then we will talk about the nonlinearity layer and the decaying learning speed across the network. So we will revise the logistic sigmoid and we will introduce the rectifying linear unit. Moreover, we will introduce the LP pooling layer, where two specific cases are the average pooling and the max pooling. Then again, we will see the rational and we will have some conclusions, where we will show what are the benefits of using convolutional uh, layers and pooling layers. Then we will switch to the shell and the command line and we will uh, install the pretty NN package in order to have color-coded network architectures which is going to ease our understanding of the models and will be fundamental for the next practical. And finally we will introduce the eLab Torch 7 profiling tool. Uh, it's a tool I, I wrote uh, around October 2014 and now has more than 200 commits from all the members of eLab and others with which we will profile a convolutional neural network in Torch and compare the results we have computed before manually. In the field of image understanding, let's find out why convolutional neural network had had a major role. But let's start with a neural network which goes from, let's say, a neuron in input to um, three hidden layers of size twice as the um, input, so 2n, 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 and then uh, ca capital K uh, output. Let's compute the number of operations that a similar network may require uh, if used for uh, image processing. Let's say we start with an image, which is a color image, so we have three planes, RGB, and which are of size 256 times 256 and then in depth we have the three color channels uh, RGB so in this case n is going to be equal to 3 times 256 times 256 which I can write as 3 times 2 to the power of 8 and 2 to the power of 8 which is 3 times 2 to the power of 16 overall we can uh, count here uh, 2n, 4, we can have 2, 4, 6, 7n so we have uh, 7n plus k uh, neurons which in this case is going to be 7 times 3 times 2 to the power of 16 which is roughly uh, 1.4 uh, million we have that to go from the first layer to the second layer we are going to use a matrix which has height 2n and with n. Uh, then here we are going to have a square matrix 2n, 2n 
another square matrix here to end to end and then here's something like k and to n so if i count um, how many multiplications and additions we are gonna have so we're gonna have 2n square plus 2 times 4n square plus 2 capital K n um, so we can neglect this term here uh, we have overall 2 times 4 8 plus 2 roughly roughly 10 n square which is equal to what uh, 2 times 5 times um, 2 to the power of 32 and 3 to the power of 2 so this is actually is going 2 to the power of 33 and this is roughly 390 Yeah, multiplication max mac which is multiplication and accumulation uh, let's say we are on my macbook pro Um, which I which has a Intel Core i7 which runs at 2.2 gigahertz so we can see uh, how much how much time is gonna take to process one image uh, which is a color image of 256 uh, times 256 pixels so we have the 390 yeah, divided by 2.2 gigahertz which gives us 180 seconds which is roughly 3 minutes So we have here uh, seen that to process this image here it's going to take us 3 minutes just to do uh, to send forward one image think about training where we are going to use several images in both uh, directions forward and back propagation uh, this is really impossible to uh, to go this way so what can we do uh, we can be smart and we can reduce the number of computations by exploiting the underlying distribution of our data so if we actually think about uh, what we are trying to achieve here and we are not just um, blindly applying a neural network to whatever problem it is we see that our images um, are um, having our Im images have very distinct um, specific characteristics given that they are uh, natural images images they are not uh, random noise so the two main points that we want to keep in mind images are sp highly spatially correlated means if two points on the screens are closed nearby it, it's likely that they will be that we have the same color uh, most, of, most of the time they will be black in this case but if you take two points close to some uh, natural images both those values will be very close in value and moreover in images objects are made of parts
Let's see how to exploit these two particular aspects of images in order to reduce the amount of computation and therefore speed up the whole system. So the first thing that uh, it's very important to keep in mind when we speak about convolutional neural network is that they introduce sparsity. Uh, here we can see that we have a fully connected layer uh, L minus 1 which is connected to the L layer L with uh, all the connections as we have seen uh, moreover there will be the plus 1 uh, for the bias here on top which is connected to the uh, three neurons uh, on the right hand side of layer L the same here we are going to have the bias on top which is connected to the uh, single, single neuron of layer L plus 1 so how can we exploit this correlation in order to uh, reduce uh, the number of computations? We can uh, say that, for example, the first neuron here can simply see a subgroup of the input because input pixels nearby will have uh, some kind of will carry some kind of information relative to the object or to the location where they are coming from but it's very it's quite unlikely that pixels that are far away will have some kind of contribution for characterizing the specific location at which the first neuron may be looking at so uh, the sparsity basically means that the first neuron of the layer L is going to just look at this neuron here, the second neuron over here, and the neuron over here. And of course, there will be also the bias. For the same way, the center neuron will just see this guy here and this way and again we have the plus one for the bias analogously we have the three connections for the last one in this specific neural network we say that this, this layer here will have a receptive field RF of 3. That means that we'll see just 3 neurons from its previous layer. Let's move on and let's connect also the layer L to the layer L plus 1. So we are going to have first connection, second connection, third connection. Also here the receptive field is 3 but the receptive field with respect to the layer L-1 is going to be 5 why is that? because the neuron at the output layer can actually see 5 neurons from the input space so in this case we have that the neurons at the intermediate layer, the red one, will just see a portion of the input space and therefore will have the notion of um, edge. The neuron afterwards in, a, in the higher, as we go high in the hierarchy, will see more pixels and will and we'll be able to uh, have a better understanding of what's going on in the input image because they can combine the response of neurons that are in the intermediate level which builds up to generate a more abstract and a high order representation. We can draw here, therefore, here, in this direction, a global view direction. Eventually, the last neuron of this network will be able to see the whole input image and will be able to distinguish between different objects that we are going to propose to the network, for example, for a classification task. As we can see here, the number of computations is being greatly reduced. We will see later a numerical uh, example that is going to give us some uh, 
better understanding of the order of magnitude of um, reduction. So we said once more, sparsity give us a reduction in computations. by exploiting local correlation of the data. The second main principle on which convolutional neural network base their strength is the parameter sharing. So the first one we said it was the uh, reduction of computation due to sparsity and this one instead is parameter sharing which is going to ease the convergence of the uh, training of the model. How is this done? How does it work? So uh, we see basically that each of these neurons in the uh, red layer will share all the weights for the same kind of connection. So we can represent this by drawing here, for example in purple, this connection here. Then for example in blue we have this one. And then we have the last one in pink. Finally, we don't, want, we don't want to forget our bias, of course, which is the same, uh, which has gonna, is going to have the same parameter associated with. In this case, each of these neurons are looking for the same kind of feature in different regions of the input. As we saw when we performed the computation of A1 here, so A1 is going to be just this partial input here, we can call it um, x for the moment. So we are going to have a projection of the x for the neuron 1, so we can put a 1 here. So in this case, we project the first part of the input on the uh, specific feature, theta, uh, which is shared across the, uh, all the neurons in the hidden layers. And each of these neurons is going to look at the different region of the input space, to which is going to still look for the same kind of uh, target, the same kind of activation, the same kind of um, kernel, we can call so what we are going to do basically is the projection of portion of the input with respect to the same specific parameter vector which is a kind of feature we are going to uh, train our system on basically and then we are going to take of course our nonlinearity in order to boost the correct result and to uh, attenuate the uh, opposite parameter sharing allows us to reduce the number of parameters which in turn helps convergence in terms of time and in terms of relative error. less time and less error. So let's see how the convolutional layer actually works. So the normal case, the generic case, we are going to have an input that I'm going to call just x, which is a 3D tensor of dimensionality n1, 2D maps, n2 times n3. 
n1 maps basically or channels and these maps have height n2 and width n3 uh, for example if we are uh, in the input so if we are actually talking uh, about the real input so image input so in this case n1 could be 3 which are the 3 rg and b channels and the n2 and n3 are gonna be the height and the width of our image for example in the case we saw before it could be uh, for example a 256 uh, times 256 height and width then our output instead y it's also going to be uh, a 3d tensor of dimensionality m1 maps so we have m1 2d maps of dimension m2 times m3 and how do we get these maps so we also have a collection of kernels we call them k which is a 4d um, tensor in this case and it's made of m1 3d n1 times p1 times p2 kernels k k i finally we have a term b in this case is a vector so it's 1d and this is my m1 of dimensionality m1 bias term so how do we compute y we said we had m1 2d m2 times m3 y i feature maps so each feature map it's m2 height times m3 width so we have a 3d input which is n1 maps or channels of height n2 times n3 then the output is going to be and again a 3d tensor of m1 channels of maps of height m2 times m3 then we are going to use a collection of m1 3d kernels of dimensionality n1 as the input times p1 times p2 kernels ki and i here goes goes from 1 to m1 and then at the end we have also a term bias one dimensional which is the same size of the number of channels of the uh, feature maps y um, which is the bias, bias term now we can see how to compute these uh, feature maps we have that each and every uh, feature map y i is going to be equal x convolved with each of these ki and to which then I sum my scalar bi and we have this one for i that is going to be equal 1 up to m1 and we have that this guy over here this is the convolution convolution symbol and basically what this equation says here is that we project our input x onto different subspaces ki and then we shift them by a specific bias term it's very very similar to how we were computing the weighted input z which was equal to my theta matrix times my activation or x if it's in the first layer
So as we said here, we have that our uh, each of our feature maps, yi, is going to be equal the convolution between the uh, current input x, which is the activation basically from the previous layer, uh, convol convolved with the kernel each of the kernel uh, m1 kernels for the specific layer uh, ki and then we shift by a specific bias bi so how does it work uh, this one is a 3d convolution which it can be expressed this way so if we have for example a uh, image or a feature map f of variables l m n and we convolve with a g l m n is going to be is going to be equal the summation over all the variables u v and w of f in u v w multiplied by the kernel which is flipped and transposed as we sum so we have l minus u m minus v and n minus w if this is still uh, very cryptic i'm gonna draw something perhaps it's gonna be more uh, easy to understand afterwards. So I have here my um, x which we said it's n1 here and 2 here and and 3 here. Inside we have our kernel uh, could be for example 3 by 3 and this guy as we see from this equation is going to move this direction and this direction from where it is for example in this first location it's gonna be outputting my first value it is a one by one pixel so this is one 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 okay so then it's gonna move across uh, towards the right and, and down so at the end I'm going to have something that is like this and maybe it goes also down here just one here in the uh, depth dimension is going to be of height m2 and width m3 and this stuff is repeated times m1 times so that we can end up having our final output y with m1 uh, maps and then the height is going to be m2 and the width m3 As you can re recall from the uh, classical neural network case, uh, after we compute uh, z from the uh, linear operation on where we have the uh, matrix multiplied uh, with the activation from the uh, previous layer, uh, then we are going forward and computing the new activation as the nonlinear function applied to our uh, weighted input. In this case, in our case, our weighted input is called feature map. And the projection is 
is done with convolution. We have now to apply the nonlinear function to our feature map or our weighted input. Um, we can start by uh, having uh, a look to the uh, nonlinear function we already seen in the previous uh, lesson. So here we can draw, for example, sigma of z, and here we have z. And if this is one, it's gonna be half. Uh, roughly, if it, this is gonna be five, and if this is gonna be minus five, we are gonna have something like, and then it goes this way, and. The problem that we have with the sigma is that if I compute the sigma prime in z, we have that if this was 1, this is going to be half, this is going to be a quarter, uh, still the same, si uh, same x-axis, minus 5, 5. We are going to have something that is kind of very annoying. As we can remember, every term delta in our neural network was multiplied by something here, was multiplied by the derivative of my activation. So uh, every delta, every time we go in layer after layer, it's going to be multiplied by something that is at most one, uh, one fourth in when the uh, z is close to the origin and otherwise just goes to zero. So this creates um, some problems because uh, the training basically slows down uh, across the network, so the layer more close to the cost function can actually uh, change their values quite um, accordingly to what gradient descent says and establish, but the uh, layers uh, in the, uh, the lower layer, the one closer to the input, uh, so the one with less abstraction, will have some uh, gradient that are basically very 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 small and therefore the uh, grad gradient with respect to the parameters is going to be also very small and therefore the learning uh, appears to be slowed down incredibly for for the early layers. So uh, since we have to learn uh, here networks that are um, quite longer than the they are called deep neural network because they are deep they are deep in length meaning there are many layers stacked one after each other we cannot have uh, this problem of uh, learning that slows down so much uh, due to this particular effect. So we can try to remove this effect by changing our nonlinearity. And we can use this one, uh, the rectifying linear unit. Uh, as a definition, actually this is defined simply as z plus, uh, which is the positive part of z. Uh, so it's completely trivial. And let's say this is 1 and this is 1. So notice that I've changed the x scale between these two charts from the left and the right hand side. Uh, for the derivative, uh, we are going to have, of course, it's not dif differentiable in uh, uh, z equals 0, but we don't really care too much. Uh, so if this is 1, we are going to have simply 1 here. And this is 0. And we can define that it stays here in 0 on this point.
in this case we can see that the problem of having uh, the the derivative very low was, was is not going to happen here and we don't have uh, this slowing down across the network uh, due to the uh, non-linearity. Uh, this technique was introduced in the paper uh, of uh, Alex Krzyzewski and uh, Geoffrey Hinton uh, when they submitted their uh, the first deep neural network uh, in 2012 for the ImageNet challenge. And they write in, a, in their paper, they, they show that rectifying linear unit uh, helps a lot speeding up the training. The last layer used uh, by convolutional neural network is the pooling layer. So what does this layer uh, do and how it works? Let's go in how it works and then what it does. We explain what it does. So let's think of having here a piece of feature map, one of the M1 slices, for example, coming out from the uh, convolutional layer that is going after the pointwise nonlinear uh, function. And here we may think to get, for example, this first region here and compute the LP norm. so that we end up with our first output here. Then we apply, for example, a stride equal to the size, to the width of this uh, running window. So our second window is going to be in this position here. And then it's going to perform again the LP norm, which is going to give me my second value here and so on, so I can keep going. Just for clarity, if we would like to compute the p-norm of a vector, this is going to be equal to the p-norm, uh, p-root of the summation across all components of x to the power of p. Uh, moreover, if p uh, the p norm uh, tends to max of the components of x when p tends to plus infinity. Max pooling can be simply seen as a specific case of the most more generic LP uh, pooling. Uh, what does it do? Basically, if we see in the dimensionality, if we apply a stride equal to the size of the kernel here, the, the running window, we are going to obtain an output which is uh, shrinked in size. So if we started with M2 in height, and M3 in width, we are going to get, for example, M3 half and M2 half. The number of channels is still M1. So the pooling operation uh, works across the uh, spatial dimensionality and reduce the number of neurons by dropping them if we choose for example the max uh, operator and therefore just the maximum activations are carried across the network and are gonna be then used for later on for later computations. Uh, sometimes the L2 norm is used instead to average out all the um, activations to instead having higher robustness for uh, noise. So there are different cases which require different kind of norm, uh, different kind of p value. 
So uh, for this reason I presented here the generic pooling, uh, LP norm pooling rather than just the max pooling, which is most commonly, uh, I think, used. Now that we have seen what are the main blocks of a convolutional neural network, we can see uh, how the initial example where I was computing the number of computations and the time to process one image can change if we do apply, uh, if we do use convolutions. We can start here by uh, drawing our input, which was 256, 256, and 3 in depth, our input image. Uh, we said we'd like to have twice as many uh, neurons, so twice as many uh, pixels in the feature map, if we can say. Um, they are not exactly pixels, so they are activations activations in the feature map. So in the input space we can call uh, each point of this image a pixel. Uh, in later layer, in the feature map, they will be called activations instead. So we said 2n, therefore let's make 2n. So we still have uh, 256, 256. Let's go 6 here. Uh, still 2n, so again 6, 256, 256, um, then here once more, and then the last one is going to be simply uh, k, uh, k vector. So to go from the first block to the second block, uh, let's say our kernels k, um, ki, are 5 by 5. We said they are 3 uh, kernels, they can be 3 if we are in the first one, or 6 if we are in the other cases here. So in this first point we are going to have um, if I count the number of computations of max, we are going to have 256 times 256 times 6, that is the number of activations. Which came from a convolution of a kernel that is in this case 3 times 5 times 5. So this was the first number of computation. So for the second one is going to be the same but the only thing that changes is going to be this 3 that becomes 6. Um, then again from here to here is going to be at again 6. So I can say this one multiply by we said we have the 2 times, 2 times, 1 time, so we are going to have, you can write 1 plus 2 plus 2 multiplier, so this is going to be 5, and overall this is going to be equal to 147 million max. For the final part, we have that we start we have a matrix that is of height k and the width is going to be 256 times 256 times 6 and which gives us k times 6 times 256 times 256 which is going to be k multiply by 393,000. If we think about the ImageNet classification, we are going to have that k is equal 1000. Therefore, this is going to be equal 393 million. Overall, we have 500 and 40 million Mac 
and if we divide by 2.2 gigahertz of my nice MacBook Pro we get something like 250 milliseconds per image so we went down from 3 minutes to a quarter of a second which in my opinion is pretty neat so we would like to keep in mind these numbers here can we do better? yes we can and we can use the uh, pooling operation which is going to be speeding up our system by at least 15 times so we said we start with um, a cube a data of 256 times 256 and 3 in depth and for example we can apply now a convolution with a stride so in, instead of applying the kernel uh, every pixel and moving it on the horizontal line or horizontally and vertically by one pixel we can move it for example by two pixels so in, the, in this case we are gonna have half f less pixels in the x direction and half f less pixel in the y direction so we will end up with 128 pixel here and 128 pixel here and we said we were going to double the size in depth so again we are gonna have six here so with this configuration see how many computations is gonna take so we have 128 times 128 times 6 which is the number of activations and then times my kernel which is going to be 5 times 5 times 3 and this one is roughly 7 million and 300 max and this first was convolution with stride then we are going to apply uh, the second convolution 6 in depth 128 in x 128 in y and again we said 6 here and this guy is going to be the same it's going to be the same because we uh, may use padding so this is not the uh, valid convolution but this is same convolution if you use the MATLAB kind of jargon so in this case we don't have to subtract uh, let's say 4 from the size of the uh, height and width since the kernel is 5 should have been from 128 should have gone, should have gone down to 124 but then it's complicated uh, to actually have nice numbers so we can just pad and then we have uh, with zero padding we are gonna keep consistent the dimensionality and we don't have to worry too much let's see how much this convolution takes so we are gonna have 128 times 128 times 6 and then we have our kernel which is going to have 5 by 5 by 6 so actually 6 by 5 by 5 14 point 7 million Mac. then let's say we apply uh, pooling so we may start with 6 128 128 we end up with 6 64 64 the number of computations is going to be 64 times 64 times 6 times our kernel is going to be for example 2 by 2 in this case and this guy is 98,000 Mac. So it's very uh, small compared to the amount of computations that the convolutional layer takes. Then we have the uh, last convolution. So we're gonna have 6, 64, 64, 6, 64, 64. And therefore the output is gonna be 64 times 64 times 6 times the kernel. So it's gonna be 5 times 5 times 6 and this is 3.7 million
and let's even apply one more pulling here so we go from 6 64 64 to 6, 6 32 32 exercise let's compute the last one 32 times 32 times 6 times 2 times 2 which is 25,000 max at the end we are going to have the last block which is 6 32 32 and this one goes to be a linear layer because it's going to be the classif classifying my k output. Um, here I haven't computed the nonlinear functions, but the nonlinear function they are simply uh, the number of neurons activations in the output layer. Uh, in the first case, it's going to be 6 times 128 times 128, which is 98,000. Uh, so here we have 98,000 of nonlinearity, MEC. And we can see it's small enough that we don't care uh, compared to the million of operations. So the final part, we have 32 times 32 times 6, which is equal to 6,000. And the final matrix, matrix is going to be K and 6,000. And if k equal 1000 for the image net, for example, uh, we are going to end up with 6 million MAC. If we check the summation of all the uh, convolutions, we are going to have that this is uh, adds up to 25.7. Uh, for convolution and the last one we said it was 6 million for the linear part so overall we end up having 25.7 plus 6 it's going to be 31 and 7 million max divided by 2.2 gigahertz we are going to get 14 milliseconds, which is roughly uh, 17 times less than the previous number. We would like now to test and verify the numbers we just computed, uh, just to be sure um, it, they are reliable and, and let's see also how much time, how long our computer my computer actually will take in order to process uh, an input image in these uh, networks that we have just shown um, before. Before starting with the, with the networks, let's set up our system with uh, some new packages. So, uh, rocks install pretty nn. Uh, moreover, we'd like to uh, git clone um, the torch 7 profiling repository from the elab website and there we go so we can uh, cd into torch 7 profiling uh, and in here we see there is uh, the profile model.lua we can do torch profile model.lua H, we're gonna have a help uh, display. It, it shows us how to use this file. Uh, moreover, it shows an example. So we are gonna call th profile model, the name of the model, the, the, where we are gonna define our model, and then we are gonna send the specific resolution. And moreover, we are gonna compute max instead of uh, both addition and multiplication, multiplications. Uh, let's create the model from uh, for our network. So we can go inside uh, the folder model models, and we can create our um, model file. So let's call it three convolution and dot lua. 
So since I don't know how to do this by heart, we're gonna just use the interpreter here below. So we can require an n at the beginning, and then we have uh, we also require pretty and then sweet true works. So we have net uh, equal and then dot sequential, uh, and then we have our first layer. So let's copy here. Okay, so let's go here. We're gonna write our first layer. So we go net add to add a new layer and then we want a spatial uh, convolution which goes from 3 because we were starting from an uh, input image of 3 channels to 6 channels we're using a kernel of 5x5 five five with a stride of 1 both directions and let's put padding of 2 both uh, sides, so to the left, to the right, top and bottom, so that the dimensionality of the output is going to be the same dimension of the input. Uh, then we go net uh, add our relu. Uh, let's copy these two guys here. So we have first one and the second one and this one is going to be my first layer all right so let's go with the second layer we can do just go up uh, it's going to be from six channel to again six channel five five uh, no stride uh, padding it's okay so, okay, then add another relu. Let's add these two guys. And this one. And then, uh, again, one more reset, right? So this one is exactly the same. And then uh, relu. And... Um, now we can add, we have to reshape and view differently the uh, cubic feature map into simply uh, one long vector. So we can do this by using um, the view uh, module to which we say just resize it uh, in one, one, one only, one only, one chunk only. So if we print now net uh, we see here it is um, a sequential. Uh, we can see there are seven modules in this sequential. So there are three convolutions. The first one goes from three channels to six channels with a, a kernel size of five by five, striding of one in both direction and adding some padding of two pixel per each uh, boundary. The second module is going to be uh, non-linearity and the rectifying linear unit. Then we have another spatial convolution, which goes again from 6 to 6, uh, kernel size 5 by 5, stride 1 and padding 2, so we can preserve the dimensionality. Again, another uh, nonlinear function. The last convolution, 6 to 6, 5 by 5, 1 1 and 2 2 for the padding. Last um, nonlinear function and then the uh, to view the, the, the 3D volume into one long chunk. So I have to add now the last uh, linear layer. Uh, since I don't know what's the size, instead of computing by hand, I can do a trick. So I can do, let's say, x is my input, so it's my torch uh, tensor um, of dimensionality 3 uh, because it's RGB. And then we said 256, 256. Uh, so, uh, if I ask uh, what is the size when I forward to the network forward x, sweet, uh, this is dimension, the dimensionality is 30, 
393 whatever so we can do net add uh, and then dot linear which goes from this dimensionality to let's say 1000 classes for the image net competition for example um, so if I print the full network again here It took some time. Uh, you can tell it's quite big as a matrix. If I print my whole network here, we have it's a sequential with eight uh, layers, and the last one is a linear. Uh, the last uh, non-linear function is not required. Actually, it speeds even uh, training without the last uh, non-linear function. Uh, this one is my third layer. And this one is my output layer. Uh, here we actually need to view, we need to add, I forgot, view minus one. There we go. As we said before, we were estimating 147 million uh, max for the convolutional part, and here we have 149, so I think it's pretty reasonable, million. Uh, then for the fully connected part, the linear layer, we were estimating 393 million, and we have here 393 million, which is also uh, quite reliable. So overall, we had 540 million and here we have 543 million uh, so it's very very close to the computations we have made and overall we, we were estimating uh, that CPU can perform one Mac per clock cycle so we were dividing 540 by 2.2 we were getting 250 250 milliseconds here instead we get that the forward took um, quite uh, half of the amount is 129 milliseconds and we have that this CPU, my computer, performed 4.2 uh, giga max per, um, per second so we have basically 2 max per clock cycle and otherwise all the numbers are consistent Let's make now uh, a test for the other network, the one with the pooling, and let's see how it changes. So let's go back to our model here. So let's save this as 3conv plus pooling. The one. Uh, this is my first CNN plus pool. So let's put a pooling layer after this convolution and after here and let's change the first convolution instead of having a stride of 1 let's have a stride of 2 and 2 so we have here to modify this last layer so let's see how to change it so we can do torch net equal require models dot three conv dash pool and this line cool so if we print the network we are gonna have this architecture where we can see <coughs> we had a convolution with uh, that goes from 3 to 6 with 5x5 five five kernel stride of 2 and 2 and padding 2 and 2 that is basically 4 uh, for both directions um, then we have the nonlinearity and the new convolution 6 to 6, 5 5, 1 1 to 2 nonlinearity and then the pooling again one similar chunk with the convolution nonlinearity and pooling then there is the view so if net forward um, a torch tensor uh, rand rand uh, rand of 3 256 256 
and then we actually ask the size of this one. Uh, we have the new number here, and we can go here and replace this one. Oops. And there we go. So this is the three conf pool. We can go down below. Uh, let's make it full screen and we can call like this one instead of 3conf we have 3conf pool everything else should be the same let's go bam <laughs> it was quite fast this time right so let's compare let's com let's check some results so Uh, at the beginning we were saying that we were getting the first convolution uh, we were estimating 7.3 uh, million and here is 7.5 it's pretty close um, then we had 14.7 and here we have 14.8 uh, we actually forgot to take in account the, the bias terms and which is adding some little uh, overhead then we were saying that the uh, the first nonlinearity would have taken 98,000 and 98,000 it is. Also, the pooling is taking 98,000 and 98,000 it is as well. Following, we had another uh, convolutional layer with 3.7 million, and here we have 3.7 million. Finally, we have the linear layer was taking uh, 6 million, and 6 million it is here. Uh, we can even see in the last column the percentage uh, of the computation, which is very uh, important. It should be always theoretically distributed across the whole network in order to have a more balanced uh, distribution of operations and also uh, of processing of the information. If we go down below, we can see that the convolutional part takes 26 million and we were estimating 25 and 7, so I guess it's correct. Um, overall, there is a total of uh, 33 million, and we were estimating 32. Divided by 2.2 gigahertz, we were assuming one uh, meg per clock cycle, we were estimating 14 milliseconds, and my computer just finished running the profiling in 11 milliseconds. And this is pretty, I would say, uh, accurate uh, estimate we got on paper uh, so far. Uh, now we could uh, hypothetically write down the network that is using only linear layers, uh, but we can see that it's, got, it's not going to even be uh, loading in men into memory. But just for exercise, we can do this. So uh, we can do. Linear, for example, and we have my huge uh, MLP, multi-layer perception, or a classical neural network. So we can write a local n equal 256 times 256 times 3, and then we have our local net equal and then sequential. Uh, and then we have the first layer. We were saying net add. We add nn.linear, which goes from n to, to n. And then we are going to do net add and then the trailer and then we have the second layer uh, which is very similar to the previous one but we are we have from 2n to 2n and the third layer which is going to be identical in this case third layer 
and then Yelp, which is going to be um, net add and then dot linear of to n, and then we go into the output, which is one thousand. And then at the end we have the return net, but this one won't even load into uh, my computer's memory, so you're free to try it yourself. I won't, I already crashed my computer previously, so I won't do it again. And that's it for today. Uh, stay tuned because in the next video we will see some pretty uh, standard architectures from the pre the first one like the Lenet and the AlexNet uh, up to the most recent uh, GoogleNet and ResNet and why they the some specific architectures have been chosen and what are their um, good points and what we can learn from this.